Michelle, I'll explain a bit. Okay. <laughs> I'll mention a bit about what uh, symbiotic simulation is. What you try to do is you have a, 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 a twin of the real system, a simulation twin of the real system. And as the system progresses, you simulate what happens and there's feedback, there's a feedback loop so that uh, you can run things on the fly and then try to predict what is the best action to take. Usually digital twins are expensive in nature. Of course, in the older systems, you have heard things like, uh, of things like multi-agent simulation. And, and for this, the problem is that it's been that they always use some simple behavior models and sometimes it's not, it's not easy to simulate accurately the human behavior. So that's what uh, we were trying to do here. Uh, Charlene's project was supposed to try to try to simulate uh, human behavior more accurately. Right. So this is a symbiotic simulation uh, concept where you got a physical system and you have sensors, right? And then you have uh, uh, effectors to affect changes. So the sensors will send data input into a simulation and simulation will then run what if uh, scenarios and then try to come up, optimize the best solution to be put back into the system. So this is at the feedback loop system. So I, I started working on this and we came up with a framework of a symbiotic simulation. You can see here is a loop. You got a real system, you got the sensors. This is a simulator and then the simulator will simulate things and then produce results and, and, and re-effect, go back and feedback into the real system. So these are some of the research work applications that I did for symbiotic simulation, uh, like building evacuation. Here we actually got humans to uh, do the evacuation, but not actually physically present. We, they were avatars, uh, controlling avatars in, in the system. And we, we tried to do uh, a evac evacuation of the a library, say when there was some uh, incident or fire in the first floor. And the results showed that actually with symbiotic simulation, you can see that the evacuation time was reduced. This, we also applied, uh, we collaborated with uh, SMART. I don't know if you've heard of SMART before. It stands for Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. And it, we try to predict if there's an accident or if there's an incident, what we can do to, to uh, uh, change the outcome, maybe to reduce travel time, okay, and then in a symbiotic way. So we call it strategy generation. We will generate different kinds of strategies to try to uh, improve the, the traffic. So here is the feedback loop here. And again, uh, of course, in a, a, a real system, you cannot tie it up with a real traffic, uh, the real traffic system, because how can you like, force an accident and all that? So what we do is we have a, a simulator of the real system, and then, and, and, and then this is the, the simulator that we use to simulate the real, the supposedly real system. So dynamic is actually a, a, a dynamic traffic assignment uh, uh, simulator devised by MIT. So we use their, their simulator to run different strategies. So based on anything that happened, we run strategies and then feedback into the system. So here's a simple experiment we did. We actually had a, a very synthetic network and then we tried to introduce an, an accident here. And travelers would travel from their source to the destination, but with the with the incident here, we will try to divert traffic. And you know, people are not uh, that compliant. So we allow a compliance rate of 50%, which means although we give some instructions to change route, okay, some people we say 50% don't bother to change. And, but with this, you can see that uh, this is when it's normal and this is after the accident happened. And then this is with the symbiotic the feedback. You can see that the time has improved. And so this shows you all the various uh, time frequencies as well. You can see that uh, when there's no accident, people reach their destination in a shorter time. But when there's incident, you actually get long delays. Right? But with the symbiotic, with the strategy generation, it's actually more spread out, which means you have less people experiencing longer delay times. Right, so this is another experiment. I, I think I won't spend so long on this. What we did was we, we did a, a more big case study, the entire network of Singapore, the expressways and some major arterial roads. And what we did was we, we did a, a dynamic tolling system. We know we are famous for implementing ERP. So what we do is now we make ERP dynamic in nature, which means once there's an accident, 
we actually increase the price for traveling in that direction. And we actually disseminate this information to the, the users. So what we did was we actually introduced incidents, accidents in certain areas, and then we increased the toll rates for these areas. And you can see actually what happens is that, again, we, 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 we said that 80% complied with the thing. You can see that uh, with, the, with the predictive tolling, the travel time is actually reduced. Right, so uh, we also investigated on crisis. We were trying to, uh, if you recall, maybe you're too young, but there was a little riot that uh, occurred in, uh, happened in Little India in, in 2013. And there was a couple of deaths there. So what we wanted to do was to try to simulate what happens as well, but it was not easy because human behavior is very hard to simulate. So that's why we were trying to, to now uh, try to model uh, human behavior more accurately. And Charlene will talk a bit about how he, he goes about doing that. So this is important in the light of maybe evacuation uh, uh, for possible MRT uh, delays and all that. You know? So uh, this is something that is, uh, which might be of interest. There are two, let me see what, how am I, uh, what time, okay, not too bad, a few more minutes. Then the, uh, I've also tried to introduce machine learning and AI into our techniques. So we are trying to introduce uh, computer vision techniques into our simulation to try to track how humans move. Right? So this is one way. So uh, what we, how we, we're using YOLO and we're trying to track humans uh, in their movement. And we've actually, as you can see, so there's a bounding box. We try to predict how humans move. And now we're also trying to introduce a uh, CNN, okay, convolutional, convolutional uh, neural network spatial temporal graph uh, framework that models these interactions. And uh, it, it's actually giving good results. So we are getting, uh, we are improving the, the displacement error by a, quite a sizable amount. Okay. So this is the, the average and this is the, the final displacement error. And we are doing it in, in a faster time as well. Okay, so um, this, uh, this is, for example, this, has, uh, this is our algorithm. And this is the algorithms of, of, of other people. You can see that uh, our tracking is actually more accurate. If there's a car here, we actually avoid the car, whereas here it actually ramps into it. Similarly here, so this one actually hits the wall, but ours actually do a, a proper tracking. Uh, Charlene also explored something in this area. And so to sum, just summarize some of the papers that we have here, and in particular, the two papers that we, we, we introduced about capturing human movement and also the, the graph TCM, which is the spatial temporal interaction modeling. Right. So uh, I, I will next pass time to Charlie Hin. who will talk about how he models human behavior through the learning. Okay. So if you are interested, you can actually come and contact me at this, at this uh, email here. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Charlene, over to you. Hi, thank you very much, Paul Gary. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Right. Today, I will be presenting our work as part of crisis management efforts to derive a learnable behavioral model for emergency evacuations. Can you hear me? Right? Okay. Yes, I hear you. All right. So I will first quickly run through the motivation for the research done, followed by some pertinent background work. And then I'll present the specific topics together with some experiments and evaluations. And finally, I'll conclude along with some future work that we're planning to do. Right, so as Prof. Gary has introduced, uh, effective crisis simulation is of practical importance. And with the significant growth in technology, we see an important need to tighten the gaps in crisis simulation so as to achieve the best possible outcomes during these unfortunate events. Hence, our motivation to bridge crisis management through technology boils down to three main processes. Number one, uh, simulating uh, learning from real life data. Number two, simulating realistic scenarios. And number three, prescribing optimal strategies. So we will first look into some important background for each of these processes. Firstly, uh, for learning from real life data, we have uh, multi-object tracking. I think uh, Prof. Gary also mentioned this earlier. So this is uh, actually a very popular uh, topic in computer vision. So at every frame, humans are detected in the frames and then link through the frames to produce individual trajectories. And these individual trajectories are probably prediction that you can use to uh, train a behavior model and things like that, right? So next we look at uh, some background of human behavioral model. 
There are also different types of behavior model. For social force model, they, lose, they use concepts from fluid dynamics, physics. And evacuation decision model comes from uh, observations from the World Trade Center disaster. And then there's also escapinics behavior that comes from social sciences, like the urgency theory, decision-making theory, and so on. Right? And lastly, our, the third process was prescriptive simulation. We can look at prescriptive simulation as an optimization problem. So there are already several optimization methods available today, from minimizing costs to maximizing rewards, and also Pareto optimization for multi-objective uh, problems involving multiple criteria. So we take all this into consideration and we identified uh, the key knowledge gaps from all the reviews of our literature. We found that the state of the art still lacks a behavioral model capable of reflecting learned characteristics through actual videos of pedestrian movements. So we understand that attention and memory mechanisms from deep learning can capture such characteristic features as many works of literature has shown. But we still don't have a behavior model that can effectively integrate that capability yet. Now, having this would allow the possibility for realistic simulation of specific scenes when you want to uh, simulate crisis uh, evacuation and so on. Then within the single scene, we can still simulate several what-if scenarios. We also need a dynamic behavior model that can evolve accordingly through the simulation as danger escalates. So from a normal behavior to investigating to evacuative behavior. Right? So this can help produce realistic outcomes for effective pre uh, prescriptive analytics. So first, I will uh, explain how we derive our behavior model. So based on several prior works, we extract these important forces that needs to be considered. Firstly, the attraction towards a desired target. Secondly, the attraction towards distractions along the path towards the target. So this is applicable to both normal conditions like artworks and buskers and stuff. Then uh, also for emergency situations like exit signs and security ushers to point the way out and things like that. And finally, some re uh, the repulsive directions to avoid colliding into obstacles, both static and uh, moving. So several behavior models up to even the most recent works in 2019 still considers these forces among all other complexities that they introduced. But as for our behavioral model, uh, we looked further into some important concepts from social science theories, such as the decision-making theory and the urgency theory. Here you can see the pushing for space suggests that humans have this tendency to move to an empty space along the direction towards their exit. Thus, we need to consider this with respect to their attraction towards their goal. Right? And then we also looked at uh, some ob observational studies from real life crisis, such as the World Trade Center disaster. Uh, we confirmed that humans are capable of log logical thought, such as, uh, as uh, described in the decision-making theory as well. So this supports the notion of conscious aware movements, such as the attention to surroundings and their prior knowledge, like the memory. And lastly, uh, we also understand that perceived level of risk influences urgency. So we can isolate emergency behavior as the level of urgency that influences the force of motion towards their rationally desired direction. Okay, so considering that their rational decision making based on memory and attention primarily affects the directional motion, while emergency behavior only affects the urgency, which is the force of motion towards a target, we can separate these two influences of motion. So then the direction of motion will have the attraction and the repulsive directions where the attraction direction will have the, will compute the attraction towards goal, attraction towards empty space, and attraction towards distractions. And then the repulsive direction will compute the repulsion from colliding into obstacles, both moving and uh, static. Right? Then these four directional forces will need to go through uh, the attention and memory mechanisms to derive a resulting directional force. See, this is the space where we try and capture different priorities for the directional forces instead of just summing them all up and, like most prior works do, deriving the resultant force offset by one another. Then finally, we compute the force of motion from this uh, resulting direction, influenced by an urgency term computed by measuring an individual's perceived level of risk at every predetermined time step. So based on this derivation, uh, we introduce the conscious movement model. Here, the term conscious, as defined in the English dictionary, is being aware of and responding to one's surroundings. It is an appropriate term for our behavior model that aims to react accordingly to surrounding forces based on attention and memory, which we can think of as uh, rational thought. Right? So the equation for the CMM at time t is as follows, where the result from the memory function of both the attractive and repulsive attraction di uh, direction of motion 
with the attention G and the previous constant movement from the previous time set is multiplied by the moving force at a rate proportional to the level of calmness. Right? So this level of calmness here right, is uh, the inverse of urgency. is based on perceived level of risk, changing an individual state from normal to investigate and to evacuate based on its own encounters with threats, healths, or other agents in its view. So for the algorithm to determine a pedestrian's level of calmness, we start off each agent at a normal state. So upon encountering any threat or direct evacuation warning, their state will imagine immediately change to evacuating. Then uh, otherwise, if say, otherwise, then they will actually compute the average level of calmness from all the surrounding agents and transition into investigative state only if it falls below a certain threshold here. Yeah. Then once in investigative state, again, if a threat was encountered or the agent's calmness dropped below a certain calm threshold, it will transition into evacuative state. And otherwise, it tries to get the direction of the threat from surrounding agents and move towards that direction in an attempt to investi investigate what is that threat, where is it coming from. Okay, and then finally, in evacuative state, we update the agent's level of calmness based on the perceived level of risk computed by the agent's current distance from the threat over the safety distance predefined for the threat against the relative weight of influence alpha on an agent's calmness. Okay, so putting it all together, the CMM, the conscious movement model, which I call a CMM, computes the attractive directions and the repulsive direction, then compute the attention between the attractive directions and the attention against the repulsive direction before going through the long-term and short-term recall gates as their memory mechanism, before finally going through a final attention layer to produce the desired direction. And we use this desired direction to influence the moving force, uh, also influenced by the level of calmness, with respect to the perceived level of risk to finally produce the final velocity for an agent at time t. Right. So now we evaluate the effectiveness of the proposed uh, CMM in two conditions, normal and emergencies. So for normal conditions, we can show how well the CMM can predict trajectories after being trained on real-life video data. We can then quantitatively evaluate its displacement errors to show its accuracy performance. Then as for emergency situations, we can show how the CMM can achieve similar output measures to real life case studies of emergency evacuations, simply by running it on the same scene without explicitly programming its behavioral characteristics. Then we can measure the development of calmness and the average speed over time to reflect the realism of urgency in such evacuation situations. So firstly, to, in order to run experiments for the first evaluation, we will need to train the memory and attention mechanisms that we mentioned earlier. So the memory and attention mechanisms, we call it the conscious movement memory attention, CMMA model, which is inside the CMM, the conscious movement model. Okay, so for the memory mechanism, I'm calling it CMMA. The behavioral model is called CMM. All right. So to achieve this, we need to use real life video footage of the scene we want to experiment it on. Okay. So using the MOT concept, we integrated the CMM behavior into the architecture to predict trajectories in subsequent frames. Then to train the CMM, we can use ground truth data to correct the errors through back propagation. However, in the event where there are no ground truth data available, we can leverage a good offline model with high accuracy from works in literature to produce a more accurate set of trajectories, then train the CMMA by batches. This will present as a hybrid model where the use of the CMM can be done online as such, while the training using outputs from a more accurate model can be done offline in batches as such. So the, so the hybrid model will then allow for a continuous incremental training as we update the behavior model each time after training it with the offline model. The optimizer here uh, refers to the training optimizer for the memory uh, attention mechanisms, the CMMA model. In our work, we use the Adam optimizer. Okay, so for now, the predicting, traject predicting the trajectories with the CMM model, we process each frame and use some object detection model to locate pedestrians in the frame. Then based on the information we can extract uh, from the frame, we compute the forces for the CMM to predict the expected position in the next frame. So now to illustrate, here the blue circle is the agent we are processing and black circles are other agents within their, with their respective velocities. So based on the current position of the blue circle, we can first try to associate it with 
the list of predicted positions from previous frames. So if found, we can deduce its general direction and assume that is the direction towards uh, the goal. Otherwise, for newly detected objects, we just assume that the agent plans to go straight towards the furthest direction, uh, furthest exit, since we assume that the agent just entered the scene. Right? So then we scan all objects, static walls, moving agents, etc., within its angle of sight and sight range, then first compute its attraction towards the goal, followed by its attraction towards empty space. And if any of the detected objects are distractions, we can also compute the attraction towards distraction at this point. Next, we can also compute the repulsive forces based on the detected objects nearby, and then use the CMMA model to get the resulting output for the desired direction. And finally, we can compute the moving force to get its uh, velocity for, this, for the next time step. We can use that velocity to predict the position in the next frame. So then this algorithm is applied for every agent detected in the frame. So in an overview, the training and prediction flow for each frame starts from object detection to object association, linking detected objects in this frame to detected objects in previous frames. Then this association would give us the actual position of that object in this frame, since the predicted position from the previous frame to this frame may have a slight displacement error. So we use this actual position detected in this frame and compute the directions of motion as shown earlier then put them through the attention and memory mechanisms within the CMMA model and compute the force of motion to get the velocity to predict the next position. Then the next frame will repeat the same process where upon successful association to the object in previous frame, we can use the actual position to correct the predicted positions through back propagation. The prediction flow will then continue for subsequent frames. Training the model will only be done in batches so we can collect more trajectories for training it all at once. So now we set up our experiments using publicly available datasets, the Kivia dataset and Oxford Town Center datasets. These datasets are popularly used datasets in computer vision to evaluate deep learning models. Hence, we confirm the adequacy of data used for training the CMMA neural network model as well. We also would like to highlight at this point that we are not using these datasets to train a generic model. The CMMA should only capture the characteristics of behavior found in the respective videos. This will allow the CMM to be applied to other scenarios provided that there are video data available for that scene. So put it simply, we train the behavior model from video data of a scene or an area. So we can simulate that area using the trained behavior model. Right? Essentially, the CMMA model intends to capture the non-generic characteristics from video to influence the CMM model. Okay, so for the first evaluation goal, we'll compare the results from the hybrid model against the result from uh, existing methods. So existing methods include SOFI, the uh, SOFI uses social and physical attention mechanisms, as well as generative adversarial networks GAN to generate samples, plausible, sample, samples of possible path trajectories. Okay. And then social LSTM uses long short-term memory LSTM networks to capture spatial interaction between neighbor, neighboring pedestrians. And as for social GAN, it extends social LSTM and introduces GAN to generate plausible trajectories as well. As for social STG CNN, it uses convolutional neural network CNN to extract spatial and temporal features, then modeling, modeling them as a graph. Finally, STGAT uses graph attention network to model spatial interactions with an additional LSTM to encode temporal interactions for predicting pedestrian trajectories. Do note that there are no recent works that uses behavior model for trajectory predi predi prediction and achieve results as well as this. So these are you can say the state of the art in uh, trajectory prediction. So after fully training the CMA model, we use the CMM to predict trajectories on unseen sequence of the town, set data, uh, town center data set. So for clarity, we plotted three separate trajectories here, as you can see. The predicted trajectories are in blue and the actual trajectories are in red. You can see that it is not overfitted to a point where it follows the red line exactly, but rather able to continuously point towards the correct position at each point. So, we set the average uh, displacement error from existing works as a benchmark and compare our average results of the CMM against them. So the resulting average for our CMM is uh, 0.55, while the final displacement error is 0.74. So on an average across the number of trajectories, the CMM actually rests comfortably in the middle range, which is considered good since uh, it is the only method using a behavioral model that attempts to capture movement behaviors rather than pattern recognition from images. Right? So then we experimented this model on two different cases to compare the results. Firstly, 
uh, we train the model on caviar data set, then evaluate the trajectory prediction on town center data set. The results are poorer as expected, as you can see here. So as we said, the CMM is not meant for generic application. So then next, we compare it against another CMM model trained using ground truth data only instead of the hybrid model. This is trained using the hybrid model. And we, we can see that, uh, of course, the uh, ground truth is better, but our results are not too far off. So based on these experiments, we made an important learning point that hybrid training on the same video data is better than training the model on a different video data. And of course, training on ground truth data is better since the offline model that we use to train the hybrid model is not 100% accurate either. Yet we can still achieve a close error scores. So therefore we have shown that the CMM can reproduce realistic characteristics of human behavior in specific scenes where it is trained on. Now some assumptions and limitations of our proposed method so far, we will require video data such as CCTV, et cetera, for training the CMMA model first, with or without ground truth data is possible, as we shared earlier, using the hybrid data for uh, cases where we don't have ground truth. And also transfer learning is possible, but accuracy may suffer depending on how similar the data is, uh, the data used for training and where the trained model will be used for. And then for training the CMMA model without ground truth, we will require a reliable and accurate data association or offline model, as I mentioned earlier, to yield better results. So, and finally, the methods are not yet applicable for real time since we are not evaluating the speed performance. At this point, we are trying to evaluate how accurate uh, the CMM model can uh, generate uh, human behaviors. Okay, so now we move on to the simulation framework that leverage on the CMM behavior for a more effective prescription of strategies, which is this part here. Okay, so we can adopt the CMM for three different roles by setting the appropriate goals. For evacuees, the goal is simply to reach the nearest or safest exit. Then for staff or security ushers, their goal would be to get to as many people as possible and pointing to the best evacuation route while maintaining their personal safety. And finally, for rescuers, their goal is to reduce threat and guide evacuees to safety. Then in a realistic settings, uh, realistic evacuation setting, each evacuee may consider changing their goals to avoid getting hurt or evacuate quickly, either by rushing to the nearest exit or by looking for the safest exit. This decision-making process can be thought of as a game of weighing the risk and rewards. Hence, we developed our own panic game to help each evacuee decide whether they should update their goal or not. So the panic game will continuously check if a threat has been spotted or evacuation warning was received. It will then up immediately update the goal to the nearest, safest exit. Over time, when an agent speed, agent speed drops below a certain speed threshold, it will increment a weight counter. Then whenever an agent returns to acceptable moving speed, it resets this weight counter. So when that weight counter exceeds a certain weighting threshold, it will scan its surroundings for better options. So if a neighbor has a different goal, perhaps relate through other agents or archers, etc., and begin moving faster, it will consider updating the agent's goal. Then at the end of it, if at least one or more options are available, it will update the agent's goal to the nearest and safest exit. So since we have here removed the current goal in the beginning, right, the nearest exit will definitely change in this situation, which is all right, since the weight counter here has already exceeded, meaning this agent is probably quite far back in the bottleneck and waiting for a long time. So now we can deploy our agents into scenarios based on real life case studies. The first case study is in a small classroom as shown here with only one exit. So achieving similar output measurements to the real life case study in our simulation will show that our model can reflect human behavior in similar real life case scenarios. So here, these are the results from the uh, case study from Vanumu and Al. We simulated the evacuation over four scenarios with different door widths and desired speeds and validate if our model can achieve similar output results in each scenario. This is the demo of the classroom evacuation in Unity 3D using the CMM behavior model. So we computed the population variance for an initial sample, initial sample or for each scenario and concluded that no less than six replications were required. So then we collated the results
scores that we have achieved for each scenario uh, is acceptable. Hence, we can accept the null hy hypothesis, proving that the simulation model can achieve the same output measurements. We then conducted experiments on different indep independent variables to monitor how different speeds can affect the total evacuation time. We categorized moving speeds into four separate bands, slow walk, fast walk, jogging, and running. So for 25 evacuees, we look at the effects of different speed bands on evacuation time with different door sizes. We found that high speeds uh, will only make it worse on the resulting evacuation time only when the exit is too small. However, when uh, we find the doorways, we can see that uh, it, the faster speed can allow for shorter evacuation time. However, fast walking and jogging speed can also actually allow for a uh, similar average evacuation time with lower possibilities of heart collisions and injuries since uh, high speed can cause uh, more injuries and harder impacts. Right? So then for, for a fixed 0 0.8 meter door, we found that the evacuation time increases proportionally with more people evacuating. Although the fastest speed can achieve the lowest average evacuation time throughout the different numbers of evacuees, we can see that jogging speed can achieve very low evacuation time as well, almost similar to running. So of course, a lower speed will be better if it actually achieves the same uh, evacuation time. Right? So since this is quite a simple experiment with considerably, considerably little options for improvement, we can easily deduce a possible solution for a classroom with a typical size of 30 to 35 people should have a door no smaller than 0 0.8 meters and preferably a regulator such as a teacher or student leader to ensure the speed of evacuees are within the fast walking to jogging speed range. So now we can evaluate the emergency behavior by looking at the development of calmness over time against the average speed. In a smaller setting such as the classroom, the spread of emergency is much faster as everyone is much closer to each other. Hence, we can see the average speed spikes as the level of calmness drops. And as evacuees start to leave the area of evacuation, getting past the exit, the calmness levels start returning to normal and speed becomes more regulated as it slows down. So next, uh, we use a case study of a bigger enclosed space for a better uh, study of how human reacts in a bigger setting. Right? So a theater with multiple exits is used. We set up the 3D model in Unity to a pro proportional scale with the real life case study and simulated the evacuation over three scenarios of different numbers of evacuees and control staffs to guide sa evacuees to safety. We first validate if our model can produce a similar exit flow rate in each scenario. This is the demo of the evacuation in a theater using Unity 3D as well. Okay. Uh, similar to case study one, we did a student's t-test to measure the similarity of outputs between the real life case study. This is the output results from the real life case study against our simulation model. These are the results of our simulation model over six runs for each scenario. And then we computed the, uh, the T-scores for the hypothesis test. And we showed that for each scenario, we are able to accept the T-scores and proving that the average exit flow for each scenario from our simulation is very much similar to the output results from real life simulation. Now for the evaluation of calmness development over time against the average speed, we found that in a bigger setting, such as a theater, the level of calmness uh, decreases gradually, more gradually as compared to a smaller space. This is probably because uh, people need uh, longer distance to get to their exits, right? However, the average speed here uh, began dropping at a period where people are already at the exit waiting for the jams and bottlenecks to untrop, right? So at this point, the level of calmness still continues to drop. Then as more evacuees start to leave the scene, we can see the level of calmness begin to restore to normal and the average spin becomes more regulated towards the end. So this logic is also something that we can expect in real life scenarios as well. So in summary, we have presented a simulation framework to leverage the CMM behavior model for fire evacuation simulation. And hypothesis tests show, found that the CMM can produce similar measures to real life evacuations for both smaller space, the classroom, and bigger spaces with multiple, uh, multiple exits, such as a theater. We also studied the development of calmness against the average speed over time reflected by the CMM, and it shows realistic progression or, and regression as exits clock and unclock. So a realistic behavior model would allow for better optimization for prescriptive analytics. So here we show an example of using the simulation framework for prescriptive analytics. For this example, we use the mean cost flow optimizer uh, to optimize the evacuation time based on evacuees flow of evacuation. So we provided two strategic options here, staff at exits 
to improve the exit flow rate and stops at ALTS to improve the flow rate at IOAs. Yeah. So for each run, uh, we plotted the number of strategies executed and the best average evacuation time among all strategies in that run. So each strategy is simulated over 10 replications. We started with zero stops at ALTS and zero stops at exit, so zero strategy options. So then the first run generated three strategy combinations and the process repeats. Our terminating condition will stop if the will stop the iteration if no better average evacuation time was found after two consecutive runs. So you can see, see here in the third run, there is a very low average evacuation time. So then finally, our prescriptive analytics present the top five strategies sorted by average evacuation time. So note here that we are not proposing an optimizer at this time. We are showing the applicability of our solution to prescriptive analytics. So now in conclusion, we presented the CMM that can dynamically transition between normal and emergency behaviors and learn pedestrian dynamics from video to improve its realism rather than producing generic behavior. This allows for more effective prescriptive analytics through the simulation framework introduced. We would also like to highlight some of the limitations of our work. Firstly, since our focus is particularly on fire evacuations to allow for a clearer focus and exploration, its application to other crisis events will require further investigations and experiments. Then as for data availability, the crisis events are regarded as a highly sensitive event due to loss of lives, etc. Therefore, no publicly shared data are available. Hence, our methods provide an alternative to such lack of data as we can also quantitatively measure the accuracy of the model to reflect normal behaviors, then how the influence of calmness affect the development of speed or urgency over time in evacuation scenarios. So these measurement metrics can allow us to observe expected phenomena as reported in several experiments and social science studies on evacuation behaviors. So even if such data for crisis uh, becomes available, we can only use them to evaluate the emergency behavior of the CMM to some extent, since people in different places in the world may behave differently in different crises as well. So even if you have this crisis data, how applicable are they to be used in other uh, crisis simulations? Those are something that we, can, we have to further investigate. Right. So then by finally, performance-wise, the proposed framework can currently be used for predictive simulation ahead of time and prepare strategies before the occurrence of crisis. So we are focusing more on accuracy here and providing a foundation for realistic simulation of crisis that further work can better be built upon. Hence, we did not evaluate the methods on speed performance. Therefore, for future work, we would first recommend evaluating and improving speed performance through parallelization and distributed architectures. And secondly, we could also look into possible optimizations to the behavior model and perhaps the training processes as well. And Finally, working with related authorities to acquire crisis data for further evaluation of emergency behaviors where applicable. So in closing, we believe that this work has built a foundation to advance realistic behavior uh, modeling, realistic behavior modeling for crisis simulation that could lead to important work in future. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof and Charlene. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. So uh, first one is to Charlene, I guess. Uh, uh, from person, uh, he was wondering what is the smoothness of the main function that one predicts bi bracket t, and if it's smoothness, if it's smooth or not, what does it say about the function and the model as a whole? This was wondering what is the smoothness of the main function. Hmm. Okay, you mean the smoothness of trajectories? Uh, yeah. Here we measured the uh, measure the we did we did experiments to measure the smoothness of the trajectories separated by measuring the average square magnitude of the jet. Uh, we also did some of the uh, pedestrian phenomena that we uh, experiment, experimented against, and we showed that against existing existing uh, works such as the Hader social source model. Our, our model was able to achieve much smoother trajectories and even for panic as well against other emergency, uh, what you call that, uh, behavior models as well. And what else is the question? 
And how is it a way to model the system using Navier Stokes equation? Because this, yeah, Navier Stokes is more used for fluid dynamics. No? Fluid so dynamics. that one is more mesoscopic. We are doing actually individual agents. So it's uh, yeah. be like a BDI thing you know, for AI. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and he has a follow up question. Does the model make any recommendation on size of opening, i.e. how big the door should be allowed? An optimal number of people to pass through. So on size of opening, how big a door should be able to allow an optimal number of people to pass through? Yeah, so, so yes, that is what the prescriptive analytics can be used for. Uh, what can I? Yeah, so that's what the prescriptive analytics can use for. One of our case scenarios, we actually uh, did experiment on different door sizes. So this is something we can also use to experiment uh, how, how much uh, exit flow rate, what's the maximum exit flow rate that can, uh, that can allow how many people to get through the door with different sizes. And then we can actually try to derive a more optimal uh, door size. So having too, uh, too large a door also might, might not be uh, optimal in the sense. So yes, uh, our experiments can perhaps uh, include in prescriptive analytics the, the different door widths and then uh, reduce the, what you call that, try to optimize by uh, playing with the different sizes of door widths. There is something you can do in our prescriptive analytics as well. Yeah, yeah. Have Sorry, yeah. Uh, just think there's one question. Uh, uh, dense crowds, panicking crowds in training data. Eldrick asked this question, so I, I uh, help answer a bit. Uh, Charlene, you can add to it because we, we don't have. It's very hard to obtain uh, real panic data because we we, we actually tried to ask uh, Home Affairs and the LTA for data pertaining to the riots and traffic and all that, but it's very hard to get this. Uh, <laughs> And so usually what, when you yeah. crisis, you don't, you don't have this data, right, Charlene? Correct, yeah, we don't have that. So, but what we do have is usually in, in evacuation settings, what are the evacuation uh, time in certain scenarios, the average exit flow. So we try to um, manipulate our, uh, or rather influence, influence our behavior model with the calmness level to see how, how similar we can uh, show that urgency in evacuations. And next is the. Yeah, the question is any plans to incorporate uh, into architecture? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is just a, a, a preliminary framework. Right? So we intend to try to come up with a prototype. Uh, yeah, something like, I didn't show. Okay, I removed it. Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, anyone, anyone tr in, uh, interested to continue with me? Because Charlene has finished his PhD. <laughs> okay, actually, we, uh, we have a general question. So, Charlene, what were some difficulties you have encountered in doing this project? And mm. if you were to give some advice to students who are interested in such kind of projects, right? What will the advice be? Yeah, yeah I guess, uh, firstly, data. Data is very important. So, before you start anything, I think you should really look into the data that you need to actually carry out that project. And so, Firstly, data is number one, bring your data. And number two, uh, how, how much of an area you cover, you need to be able, you need to understand that you have, you have to uh, be able to really explore each specific area uh, very well. So yeah, I think importantly, I guess you need to have that uh, motivation or interest in those areas in order to, you know, push yourself further, even when uh, you hit a brick wall or things are getting challenging, uh, that interest will help to push you further. I think that is very important to look out for what interests you most. And when you do start on a project, <laughs> actually check the data that is available and how, 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 how accessible it is to you. Is there any like similar challenges like, in, in your project? Yes, 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 definitely. The crisis data, of course, the pending crisis data. So then, yeah, it took some pivoting and finally uh, we, we realized actually from uh, social science and all these studies that I, I did and reviews and all this, I find that uh, emergency behavior that influences urgency can be viewed separately from uh, human behaviors in normal conditions. So I tried to create an alternative in that. So yeah, 
So that's a, a different perspective, I guess, in my uh, thesis work. So yeah, that was the challenge uh, moving as from a start yeah. towards the end. Yeah, yeah, sounds really interesting, but also tough at the same time. <laughs> yeah, we have another question from person. Uh, uh, open to panelists. Are there any papers you would like to recommend uh, the participants to, to read if you are interested in learning more about this? Yeah. I think I will be publishing a paper related to this soon. Okay, so guys, yeah. just looking forward to Shalin's paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what we can do is when it's, because uh, uh, now it's under review, right? So when it's published, maybe I can send to the NUS hackers and then me hackers can help to, uh, or if you can leave your email here, then maybe I will get in touch with you as well. Okay, okay. Okay, so maybe we'll take another question. Um, so uh, what are some skill sets you would like to recommend us to develop if we are interested in doing this kind of project? Just now I saw Prof. Gary uh, mention about more machine learning projects. So what are some more specific skills that we should be equipped with if you want to do some project like this? Okay. Yeah, you can, you can help, you, you've gone through it. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, yeah, I think you, it's best that you read recent works in perhaps uh, this uh, new age technologies, IOTs, digital twins and AI. These are things that uh, are latest and would push this area of, uh, of study. Right? And I think there are a lot of uh, work that, are, that have been introduced in recent years, but not all of them are applicable to everything. So I think it's important that uh, you need to keep yourself up to date to uh, what people are doing in recent, in recent work, uh, recent, recent research. So what you mean is to select the relevant information to the research, right? Correct, right. I think uh, I think that's all for QA. So thank you, Shalin and Prof. Gary, for the interesting talk on the evacuation plan and the price simulation. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a two minutes break while Prof. Christina is setting up. So yeah, we will start at seven fifty-seven. So Chris, Prof. Christina, if you would like to set up, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay, I think since Prof. Krishna is here, maybe we'll just uh, start. Uh, okay, I'll do a brief introduce of you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Prof. Krishna is going to talk about managing server resources for SOC module. She is a senior lecturer in computer science. She has been teaching software engineering uh, and computer system topics for the past 10 years. She, co she completed her PhD at NUS, working on performance analysis of peer-to-peer -peer system. By focusing on teaching, she hopes to increase students' interest in computer system topics such as operating system, parallel computing, and computer networks. Okay, let's invite Prof. Christina. Hello, Prof. Christina. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It was uh, it was uh, great to receive your uh, invitation and. Uh, I hope I am able to provide some new insights that haven't been presented before at uh, your Friday uh, Hex talks, because I noticed that actually um, you have quite a lot of uh, talks, interesting talks happening, um, Fridays and uh, with other occasions. I noticed that you have many uh, tools talks that are really interesting. So yeah, I know I know about uh, the talks and uh, I have been following the talks for a while because uh, usually they are useful for the modules that I'm teaching. So I I try to to know what's happening. Good. So today um, I'm going to tell you a story <laughs> about how we manage server resources for SOC modules. Um, I'm not going to be very technical but I am going to present some technical details as well. Uh, so uh, it's mostly a story. We have a few topics gathered together. Um, some of the topics might be familiar to you. Some of the topics might be new to you because it's a mix of multiple uh, things. Um, so as mentioned just now, I'm a lecturer. Probably some of you have seen me in class. You took modules that I'm teaching. I, I have seen some names that I know in the list of participants. So it's nice to see all of you here. 
Um, usually I'm teaching operating systems, I'm teaching parallel computing. So these two modules are actually um, highly uh, technical and many times we have labs. We have labs with computers that we have to manage. Uh, we have computers that we have to resources that we have to provide to students while they are taking the modules. Um, so basically, um, the problem that we have um, is usually that uh, we need to provide these resources to the students because um, we can't assume that they can buy these resources or they can buy the exact resources that we need for uh, every module. And um, we need to provide some resources such that at the end of the day, when we do our assessment in the module, we can do this assessment in a consistent way. Basically, we give the students a platform. They know that if they test their code there, when we test their code after their submission, um, it will work in the same way. Um, also, um, different topics or modules will need different uh, resources. So please note that when I say resource throughout the talk, I mean server resource or computing resource or um, computing nodes or computers in general. So many modules need some type of resources and uh, they need to provide these resources. So for example, uh, sometimes you need some highly specialized uh, GPUs. Uh, for uh, AI classes, you need access to those GPUs to run models and so on. You can't assume that the students will buy it. You can't assume that the students will figure out how to work uh, in a simulator. So we actually need to provide the access to the students. So we need to give the students to access to these resources. Um, also nowadays, as we all know, we are running our classes in so many ways. <laughs> We are either running our classes face to face or online or remote or hybrid. So basically we need to access our resources from anywhere. Uh, we need to use these resources in many ways. Um, before we were uh, just assuming many times that the students will just come down to a lab, sit down at the lab to a desk and actually program there. Nowadays we can't assume that anymore. Also, as we all know, our school has more and more students. <laughs> this actually brings a lot of uh, load to our resources and we need to be aware of that. And because the fact that uh, many of our classes moved online coincided with the time when our students, our number of students have increased, actually uh, the admins in general and us, even us, the lecturers, we can't really understand what load is produced by the new number of students that we have. So if before we could run a class with 20 computers, uh, now probably with the increasing number of students, we need at least double the amount. But there's no way of knowing because we can't see that um, uh, load. You know, it, the students are not there. They are all connected online co using those resources. So basically, with this in mind, uh, we need to pretty much solve all these problems and provide the resources in a consistent way to the students for our modules. So what's the current status? What do we have nowadays? We have teaching labs. Basically, we have uh, physical labs where we have computers inside. Uh, for some of you, probably you never tried to go into such a lab before because you did your classes online since you started your uh, uh, courses. Um, however, these computers are many times not updated and it's difficult to access these computers remotely because the teaching labs um, are in a separate section of the network in School of Computing and we can't really access them. So basically we will not be able to SSH into the machines into the computers, into the nodes, and uh, uh, we actually need to do a lot of <laughs> setups to ask a lot of approvals to get access to those machines remotely. Um, so that's one of the things that we have. Uh, we used to use these teaching labs and the machines in those labs quite a lot. Uh, they, are, they are very important for our classes, but nowadays many of these labs are actually closed and nobody is using them anymore. Then we have also the SOC Compute Cluster, 
which became more and more used and popular in the past two years, because um, this they um, uh, the SOC Compute Cluster provides resources that can be used by all of the students. Uh, we can book resources for our modules in this SOC Compute Cluster. The students can access the resources from anywhere. And it's actually the only uh, way to give fast access to a bunch of resources to our students. Then uh, we also have cloud resources because many times our students say, OK, why don't we just go and buy cloud services and use cloud services and everybody's happy. Nobody has to manage anything. We just do that. Um, uh, yeah, you, you notice here, no discuss today. Um, actually, we tried. <laughs> Our school has tried to do that. Um, we tried to, to get uh, Amazon Web Services. And um, um, I also asked uh, our, our tech services why we don't have cloud resources available to us, because it would solve many of our problems. And um, they were like, uh, OK, you know, um, it, everything goes well with the cloud resources until we need to transfer um, data out or in to the resource. Because actually, the, the way they do their uh, billing is mostly on data coming in and out of their computing resources. And because uh, our students will need to transfer data in and out quite often, the cloud services become very expensive. So it actually doesn't make sense to book cloud resources for our teaching needs. So they tried. That was the observation. Um, so as such, we are not going to discuss this today in detail or more than uh, this. So basically, we are going to focus on these two and see what, um, uh, what usually is done to manage such resources for our modules. Um, I'm going to refer to two main topics, setup and deployment, and monitoring these resources. So many times, uh, when we start a module, we have to do the setup for the module. We have to make sure that all the computers are in running order and they have the right so software installed on them and so on. And then uh, once this is done, we have to follow through and see what happens uh, if they work properly throughout the semester. When they don't work, come in and fix them, right? And we do that. So let's take it easy. Let's, let's see what happens for each of the type of resources that we have. So let's start with the teaching labs. Um, as I mentioned, we have a bunch of computers there. They are rarely um, updated. So unfortunately, that's the status. They are rarely updated. And that's why you find nowadays many times uh, Ubuntu 16.04 on some of the machines. Um, when I say machine, it means computer, right? OK, uh, on some of, some of the computers, we'll, we'll have like software that is really outdated. Uh, you will have Windows machines and so on. Another issue is the network access is weird. We have teaching labs where we can't access from outside. Basically, we can't connect from outside. And we can't, um, within the lab, the network is done in such a way that you can't really connect from one node to another. Um, and if we think about the security labs, the security labs, the places where the computers that we use for security research and security classes, they need a specific type of uh, fencing such that the text that they run there will not run outside the network. So basically, the net network access for many of such labs is really weird. Yeah. So uh, in order to set up such labs, it's actually a pain because you don't have the way to set up the, 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 the labs. Uh, another issue that we have with the teaching labs uh, is that many times um, they are managed by the technical staff. Yeah, uh, we have the SOC uh, technical services and they manage these computers. Uh, but most of the time, what they do uh, is make sure that the computer is in working condition and make sure that there is an operating system that boots up. When we start asking for different software to be installed and so on, they need like really specific instructions from us, the teaching staff, uh, in order to install and help us install such tools. Um, so basically, the approach that they take is they get give us super user access, 
and they let, let us, the teaching staff, install whatever we want and however we want uh, uh, stuff on these machines. Um, so basically, uh, we don't get much help beyond the point that we, we can uh, uh, do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Okay, so how do we usually set up the labs? How do we deploy the software that we need um, before the semester starts? right so we have to install the software on one computer because we have many computers in the lab we need to uh, make sure that uh, all the computers have the same setup so we install the software on one computer then we configure a test student user then um, we configure all the software that we need then uh, once we configured everything and we make sure that everything um, uh, works um, we add all the accounts for all the other students and we usually have to do that before the semester starts <laughs> you notice that we have a big issue here before the semester starts we don't really know our students we don't know what students we have but we need to set up their accounts beforehand and then um, in order to make sure that everything is set up properly uh, we do a yet an, another test and then finally we tell the technical staff that okay it's fine we can replicate the setup to all the other computers in the lab so many times what happens here the technical uh, people come in and they either manually replicate the setup so they go manually at every single computer and do the setup all over again step by step or they clone the image and they go with a, with a USB stick and they plug it into the next computer and actually copy the image there. So as you can see, it's quite a lot of work and it's prone to fail quite often. And if you actually have computers that are not of the same type in a lab, you have issues because the image that you clone all the manual steps that you take in setting up the new computers might not match. So basically you have to uh, figure out what's the problem. Many times the technical staff will just tell you, oh, the, the setup failed and you don't know why. So basically you have to start over again for another machine and so on. Um, then another issue is that um, students are added to the modules later. So if we forget to add one account at the right time, basically we end up in the situation where we need to return and manually add an, one account to all computers in the lab. Yeah, so this actually happened as I'm describing it here um, to the point that about two years ago, one of the tech uh, services uh, people there helped me add accounts for about 20 students manually. So he manually went to 40 computers and did that for us. <laughs> so you can see it's a bit troublesome, right? You would say for sure there are some better solutions. Uh, there are some better solutions, but it's actually very difficult to generalize them. So yes, there are some better solutions, but they are not applied at the moment in our school. So um, I manage one of the labs in the school is the parallel computing lab. The parallel computing lab has computers that are used in CS3210 uh, parallel computing. Uh, and um, how, how do we do it there? How do we manage our machines there? So actually, uh, for this class, uh, parallel computing, I'm a bit specific about the fact that I want the students to have access to the native uh, machine, basically to run their application natively and to have access to some computing resources that are um, a bit more special, basically. We do parallel computing so we can't really assume that uh, um, like any processor intel processor is good enough for our resources so usually what i try to do i try to get um, um, xeon processors which actually are meant for parallel computing and so on so that's why it's very important to actually use the right computing resources for every single class so we have a lab how do we manage it uh, we, 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 we do scripts, yeah, we have scripts. And um, once we set up everything and everything works, uh, we have to monitor what happens. Um, basically, students come and come. They don't physically come. They, they start using the machines and they, then we have to actually see what happens with the machines and monitor uh, 
their status throughout the semester. Yeah. Um, so scripts. Scripts is exactly what you expect. You expect a bunch of scripts that are run in order to actually install, deploy different software. Uh, you can see here a bunch of packages uh, added to a script and all the packages that we add for our uh, machines there. Uh, we can see that uh, we are trying to get different versions of different packages. Luckily, these are all Linux machines, so we can do this with a script. Um, everything pretty much works with a simple script. So the script uh, to install all this software is actually about 42 lines long. And what we do in order to manage to install this for every single package, we go and call an uh, install command uh, into each of the nodes. So for every single node, we need to SSH into the node and actually install the package. Yeah, um, You can imagine that if we have so many packages to install, it takes quite a while. Uh, at the moment, there are about 24 computers in this uh, lab. So from what I understand, it takes to run this script, it takes about, um, I think, one to two hours. They, my, my TA is mentioned last time. Yeah. So to just run this script, this script will actually happen after you have an um, uh, installation of uh, operating system. And after you set up the basics of the operating system, which is usually done by the technical services staff using a clone, uh, basically an USB uh, drive, they go and just copy the image. So basically, um, it takes a long time. And pretty much it takes a long time because we are actually doing an SSH command for uh, many of the packages. We we go package by package, so it takes it takes some time. SSH is slow, um, installing is slow, and so on. You notice, yeah, you will tell us we can, we are in parallel computing, right? We have to parallelize this script to make it faster. <laughs> sure, we can. We can do that, it will run faster. Uh, I think this time they actually try to do that. My TAs try to do that, so they managed to, to run it faster, but still, you can't get much faster and you still have to do it step by step. Then once we do this setup, uh, so we have a bunch of scripts. This is one of the scripts. I, if you want to see more, I can show you more later. Um, once we have this setup done and let's say everything works fine, um, we, we need to use these resources. So the students will be the ones using the resources. Um, the students usually um, need to use one or several nodes at a time. Um, they usually need some direct access. Uh, basically, they will SSH directly into the machine and run their code there for their assignments, for their labs, for whatever they need to do for the module. Um, and then what's very special, and um, it doesn't happen for all the modules, but it happens for many of the modules, is that they have to measure the performance of their application. So when you measure the performance of your application, this means that you measure the execution time. You don't want to be impacted by other applications running at the same time on the same computer. So pretty much you hope that you get uh, um, you know, exclusive access to that machine while you run your performance measurements. So if you do your assignment and you want to see how long it takes to run your code, you hope that you are the only one starting and running your code there and then getting your execution time accurately. Uh, of course, you can imagine that there is nothing preventing the other students from actually logging into the same machine and running at the same time with uh, your application uh, and then your measurements will be all uh, messed up. Um, Another special thing that we many times need is we measure hardware counters. Um, hardware, hardware counters basically will tell you information, detailed information about what happens in hardware, how many cache misses there were. Um, uh, such things um, are accessible. So basically you can get that information uh, through using different applications in Linux like Perf. And 
you can get those measurements uh, if you run natively. If you actually don't run your application natively, basically you run your application in a virtual machine, you don't have access to such hardware counters. Or if you do, the numbers are not accurate because you have so many layers of vir virtualization and sometimes the virtual machine doesn't have access to the correct hardware counters. Uh, I'm going to come back briefly later to this virtualization issue and what what other issues are there related to virtualization. So uh, hang in there. I know you might have questions on the way about that. Um, okay, so good. Um, so this is what happens, right, overall. Uh, we are using the resources. So uh, what are the issues? We don't have enough resources at the moment, right? At the moment, as I mentioned, we have 24 computers. Um, these 24 computers, um, okay, now we have 24. There were 20 until two weeks ago. So these 20 computers were actually uh, designed to work for about 30 students. <laughs> yeah, so that was initially the number. We chose 20 computers that were supposed to cater for 30 students. Um, then slowly, slowly, we got 50 students. And this time for these 20 computers, we got, in fact, 120 students. Yeah. So 120 students for 20 computers. Imagine that the chances of a student actually running their code on one machine without being interrupted or interfere with another student are very low. So this means that we needed to do something. Yeah. Um, we want exclusive access. So we want some way of providing this exclusive access. So for us, the solution was to go toward, towards a batch processing solution. What does it mean batch processing? It means that we have a system that will help us run jobs, but our jobs have to be uh, the, uh, have, have to be jobs that don't require uh, user interaction. So basically we can just run the, res uh, schedule the job to run without user interaction and um, uh, schedule the job to run might happen that the job runs immediately if there is an available resource or the job will run later once there is an uh, available resource. So basically, this is good because it can help us uh, achieve an efficient use of resources. Basically, even um, uh, you know, you are students, right? Probably you work, I don't know, 12 hours per day, roughly, right? Uh, probably you are most active in doing your assignments, your labs, and your work, your school work in the evening, late in the evening. So um, then you sleep, hopefully. Uh, when you sleep, uh, nobody is using the resources, right? So basically, let's say at 4, 4 a.m., maybe until 8, 9 a.m., there's nobody using the resources. But before that, lots of students are using the resources at the same time. So basically, if we try to do um, some batch processing, we can actually schedule some of the tasks to be run during this time interval. Um, so that's good. Then if we can schedule jobs to run in this way, uh, we can also have some exclusive allocation of resources for a job, basically for a student running their uh, assignments. Uh, so basically the solution that we found is Slurm, okay? It's a, Slurm is a workload manager. It's open source, it's fault tolerant, highly scalable cluster management and job scheduling system for large and small Linux clusters. Um, what does that mean? Basically it will help us schedule jobs it will help us manage the computing resources. So what we see with LERM and what we can do with LERM is basically we can allocate exclusive or non-exclusive access to resources for users for some duration of time. Then uh, it provides us a way to start uh, some jobs, execute the job, monitor the work um, on a set of nodes. Uh, then, it can also arbitrate contention of resources by managing the queues of pending work. Basically, you can have queues of jobs. You can allocate some 
execution time per user or per job and so on. So it's quite flexible in helping us doing exactly this workload management. And it's exactly what we want when we have about 24 machines for 120 students. And these 120 students, uh, when they run, they might use more than one machine at a time. So basically, uh, it can be a good solution. And we, we actually tried it. Uh, we, we installed Slurm on our machines. So basically, what Slurm provides, um, if you want to look a bit into the details of uh, such a workload manager, you have a centralized manager. Um, it's uh, Slurm uh, Control D control daemon and then you have on each of the machines where you want to run programs um, slurm daemons basically each of the compute node clusters will have a daemon so basically the centralized manager will assign different tasks to, la to run on the compute uh, node uh, daemons and the compute node daemons will be the ones coordinating what uh, when the tasks start, when they finish, send back the results, and so on. Um, basically, um, um, Slurm will provide a number of tools. You can see here the tools that are provided by, by Slurm. So basically, you can run a job. You can schedule a job to run later. Um, you can see what's the size of the queue, basically how many jobs are waiting to run, and so on. You can control different things, uh, and so on. Uh, while this happens, we can also figure out what, what jobs have been run and how efficient the resources have been used uh, by logging all the information and um, keeping it in a database. Basically, we, there is a demon that will help us do that. And then we can analyze later on what happened. And hopefully over time, we can adjust our uh, scheduling of the jobs such that uh, we use the resources in a more efficient way, and hopefully we decrease the waiting time for each of the resource. So basically, you can see here that um, uh, this solution is quite good. Actually, Slurm is used by many clusters out there, many data centers out there. Uh, many universities will use Slurm to manage their own data centers and the uh, clusters. So basically, it's a uh, a highly used and um, well well maintained solution, and um, it was quite easy to set up and use it in our labs. What we have in the lab, to be exact, we have one node, a controller node that contains the controller, and then also con contains the um, database logging that is done for us. Basically, we want to see what happened once uh, um, the jobs are executed. We want to see it on a daily basis and so on. So what we did for the lab, uh, we actually did initially a um, um, uh, night day uh, time of uh, approach. Basically, during the day uh, from about 8 a.m. to about uh, night time 4 a.m. So basically, this is 12 midnight. Yeah. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 4 a.m. is basically direct access for students to actually use the nodes. So they are not fully managed by Slurm during that time. Then from 4 a.m., uh, it's Slurm time. So basically, what we do, we uh, disallow the access, the login access to the students. And basically, you, they cannot log in to these machines, and um, we, we run jobs. You'll ask what type of jobs. Uh, very simple, the jobs that the students schedule during the day to be run during the night. So during this time, when the students have direct access, they can actually schedule jobs to be run with Slurp. So they call as run, they call as batch, and th the jobs can run. Of course, if they call as run, this means that the job runs immediately. Um, there's no guarantee that the access to the machine is exclusive. Uh, there might be another student running at the same time a different job. Um, but if during the night they call, they, they schedule a job that will be done, will be running during the night, they actually get 
exclusive access to the machine or machines, depending on how many they need. And they can actually get some very accurate measurement of measurements of performance. So this ended up being quite a good solution for us. So we tried this type of scheduling for a while. So basically it was like day and night kind of scheduling. Um, but we noticed that we still have many students that will desperately mail us during this time, telling us that the computers in the lab don't work and they can't log in. <laughs> so basically, currently we are changing it to a different type of allocation. We are going to do half of the nodes, half of the computers will be under Slurm all the time, while half the other half of the computers will be direct access all the time, such that the students don't panic anymore and email us immediately. So yeah. Pretty much, um, this is what we do now. Um, so basically the students, the student view is something like this. Uh, they can run uh, their jobs with Slurm uh, on the lab machine or they can run it directly. Uh, and another way is um, they can actually see what happens in the lab. Uh, <laughs> someone is asking, who uses the lab computers at 4 a.m.? Quite a lot of students, believe me. <laughs> Yes, yes. So basically, <laughs> so, um, okay, so coming back here, uh, but, uh, basically um, the students will also say, okay, yeah, we, we have learned fine, it's great. But you know, um, when we have direct access and we want to run something immediately, how do we know which computer to actually uh, choose to run? So what we did, we actually, offer them a way to see the status uh, <laughs> the status of the resources as well. So I'm going to refer to this a bit later um, during this uh, presentation, yeah? So how they see, they monitor, they see the status of the resources. Okay, so the second resource that we have in our school is the SOC compute cluster. Okay, we have the SOC compute cluster. Um, the SOC compute cluster is um, a cluster, okay? A data center, if you want to call it like this. Uh, so good. Um, a data center um, usually looks like this. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before. How familiar are you with such, uh, such uh, uh, data centers or views? So um, do you know what's this? What's this here in this picture? What's that? How is it called? Nobody? It's a rack. Yes, a rack, yes. So that's a rack, okay? So we have a, a data center. Uh, in the data center, we have racks. We have many racks. On the racks, we have the computers. So actually the computers are here. Yeah, so this is a computer on the rack. So the problem is uh, with data centers or clusters in general is that because you have to put um, the computers on the racks, most of the time the computers are not normal computers. Uh, they are server grade. Basically, uh, they will be a bit more powerful. Um, the computation power will be higher, memory will be higher, everything will be higher, server grade computers. So this means that many times it doesn't really make a lot of sense to actually buy normal computers to put them in a data center. So you will get racks with computers that are way too powerful for a student program, yeah? So, uh, yeah, so that's the problem that we, we face with the SOC compute cluster. Anyhow, we need it. It's, it's, uh, it's a way to manage the resources and it's actually the, the only scalable and good way to manage resources in a centralized way. So we have uh, an SOC compute cluster. If you don't know where it is, is uh, next to, um, is in COM1. Uh, the entrance is on the side of the building uh, to, to computer room one. And uh, that computer room is actually full at the moment. They don't allow any new racks to be installed. And we have another computer room in um, S17, the previous School of Computing building. Uh, so it's in science. So nowadays, basically, if you want to buy new computers and install them in our school, you have to install them in computer, computer room two. Um, 
will get a new computing, a new computer room in the new building. So in about one year's time, we'll have space. OK, but until then, we don't have space. And by the way, our computing room one doesn't look like so. Basically, um, the rack distance, the distance between the racks is much smaller. It's uh, less space. Yeah, usually uh, less space means that the computers are closer and they become hotter. So a bit of background about data centers in general, clusters in general. So nowadays, you know that everybody's working with a data center. Everything, all the applications that we run, run on a data center. Um, um, the, the data centers consume a lot of power, consume a lot of energy and so on. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge business and a huge uh, problem to actually build and maintain data centers. Um, data centers also come with cloud services. So many times when you hear about cloud, it's actually a data center that has different layers of software on top, and then that makes it into a cloud. Uh, so basically, when you have cloud services behind the scene, we always have a data center or a cluster, depending on how you want to call it. Um, they say nowadays that uh, data centers are factories of the digital age, which is a quote that I like, I like a lot. And um, they consume a lot of power. They consume 1% of the world's electricity, according to a study from 2019. And they emit a lot of... Um, um, carbon dioxide. Um, it, it's it's quite uh, quite difficult to uh, actually manage them and um, um, uh, uh, maintain them. Uh, many times, when it comes to very large data centers that are maintained by big companies like Microsoft, Google, and so on, you will not know the exact location of the data center. Yeah, uh, so that's. That's how it is. There are some data centers in Singapore as well. Um, um, and uh, many times when you work with a data center, uh, the user is kind of detached of like feeling the, uh, the computer. Uh, so they're unaware of the place where their data is processed. And we don't really feel it, we don't really know. So, Basically, you can see here the, the energy consumption that I mentioned here. The energy consumption is, men is mentioned for the I ICT, uh, information communication technology, not only for data center, but it's a lot of energy usage. So you see the trend as well increasing, yeah? So currently is about 1% of the electricity, world electricity usage, but later on it will be more, so yeah. What happens in a data center? Probably Google is the best at managing their data centers. Uh, Microsoft also is coming close nowadays. They are trying their best to make it more efficient and so on. So in general, um, a, a cluster, a data center will uh, need uh, generators, transformers. And because you put so much computation power, it produces a lot of heat, you need cooling. So you always have to uh, put a lot of energy into cooling the data center. Um, Google has done a lot of work on um, designing data centers and basically figuring out what is the best way to design a data center. So they said that it's better to put on the racks computers that don't have peripherals. Um, they reuse computers, older computers, they reuse them, put them on the racks and so on. Um, and when building the data centers, when they have the racks and they have the aisles between the racks, they make sure that one aisle is the hot aisle and another aisle is the cold aisle, such that the hot air doesn't mix with the cold air. Uh, so basically, they did a lot of research about that. Ah, yeah, and another thing, they increased the temperature in the data center quite a lot. Um, so it's quite hot. It's 26 degrees in their data centers, which is hot. Yes, I know it doesn't sound hot, but it is. For computing resources, if they don't run at a low temperature with time, they deteriorate. deteriorate. So basically, they need to increase the temperature. Sorry, they need to keep the temperature low. So 26 degrees is actually already quite high. Uh, so what happens in the SOC compute cluster? Uh, we can book resources for our classes. Um, 
what they told me this year is that the only book computers for us if we need them for teaching. It was a huge demand in the beginning of this semester. And basically, um, uh, we could barely get enough computers, enough resources for our modules. So it's not only a few modules that need resources. Most of the modules will need some resources for their students. So the SOC Compute Cluster is actually the only feasible and easy solution that there is for many of the modules. However, the problem with the SOC Compute Cluster is that us, the teaching staff, cannot manage these resources. So we book them, but the technical services will be the one managing the resources for us. So every time when we want to install something or we want to do something, we need to actually communicate with the tech services to manage these resources. So uh, it's a bit of a slow communication <laughs> happening, okay? Um, another uh, thing is um, the SSC compute cluster, as I mentioned, on these racks, you usually put um, server grade computers. Because of that, uh, many times these server grade computers need to be uh, uh, used shared, right? Sharedly used by uh, more than one modules, maybe. Yeah. So many times um, they, they will say, okay, we are going to give you a virtual machine. Uh, located on one of the computers such that um, um, you can get some uh, super user access and you can also manage the resources. So basically, you can either get the virtualized resources or the non-virtualized resources. The non-virtualized means native, so your applications would learn native, but there are still many users running at the same time. The virtualized you don't know where virtual, the virtual machine is located. You don't know if it's located on a machine that has the specification that you need for a module. So um, you can make some requests, but many times they can't promise much. So basically, um, that's uh, these are some of the issues that we face. Um, some, of, some of you might ask what's virtualization. Basically, uh, virtualization means creating a virtual version of something uh, like an operating system, computing device, a server, storage device, everything. So basically, you can virtualize by adding, um, nowadays you say containers, <laughs> right? So everybody will say, okay, we containerize everything, we put a, uh, everything into a container. Basically, you have a virtual machine and inside there you have maybe an operating system or uh, just a bunch of applications running. So basically um, you don't know at the end of the day where or how the resource is physically located or managed. So this can be actually quite problematic for some modules, like for example, in parallel computing, uh, we actually want to see all the layers of the machine up to the physical layer. So we want to be able to have access to it. So if we virtualize everything, we sometimes don't, it's not really uh, good. And you'll say, okay, okay, fine. But what if nowadays the virtual machines are good enough and you will be able to, to actually uh, run your programs close to native? You can, yes, there are good virtual machines. Actually, um, one of my students is doing a study <laughs> nowadays about exactly this. What's the performance uh, of different uh, applications running natively versus running the different virtual machines? So um, um, some virtual machines are lightweight. They are easy to install. They can be a very good solution for many of the modules. Basically, you can offer a virtual machine, and then the students can work within the virtual machine. And um, uh, it will be the same no matter where they run. However, um, for some modules, um, virtual machines are not good enough. The performance of the application will be affected. So basically what you see in terms of execution time is affected by the fact that you run that application in a virtual machine. And um, the layers of virtualization, depending what type of virtualization you use, uh, will um, uh, make your understanding of hardware performance even more challenging. Yeah? So probably some of you know that when we try to understand performance, even on a native machine trying, trying to run something, you 
can't really you can't really do it right so yeah okay uh, you don't understand exactly what happens because it's not clear like how different hardware components impact each other so if you add the virtualization into this makes your life almost impossible yeah so yeah okay so these are the problems we have the resources that we have and once we start the semester we have to monitor our resources so many times um, when we monitor some resources uh, we have to uh, look inside different parts of our system or applications and analyze the timing the load under normal or stressing scenarios for an application usually we look at the performance bottlenecks of the application and try to uh, tune the code such that we improve the timing but many times we have to do the same thing for a system okay so for a system um, there are some uh, um, known anti-methodologies that uh, many people use uh, I, I presented exactly this slide in parallel computing this week and students said oh i feel attacked by this slide yes many students do these mistakes they when they look at the performance they uh, try uh, to understand and improve their performance in different ways by trying several methods that are not really quite good so first of all they tweak things at random or too early uh, without really understanding what's happening um, then um, another way is they use tools that they know they are familiar with to try to figure out what's happening um, they try to find a tool at random try to search the internet and so on and then they don't use the right tool another thing is um, they uh, tune things at random uh, without thinking which application causes the problem so until the problem goes away but many times they tweak the wrong software so basically this happens um, you notice here that I have a source if you are interested in understanding how to do your performance analysis better uh, you probably should check this website mentioned here under uh, sources it's a very good resource um, this guy Greg, uh, Greg Brandon works at um, Netflix and he has I think two books now on performance evaluation um, and um his his website to start with is a very good resource to actually understand how you can do performance um, measurements and how you can do um, monitoring in general so what do you want to do in monitoring you want to see uh, to measure different quality attributes of the system so you'll notice that i'm focusing on the system here so you want to look at the scalability, reliability, some resource usage, and so on, um, workloads in normal and uh, um, overloaded scenarios. So basically, uh, there are some methodologies out there that you can use, and there are some instrumentation tools, uh, like debugging tools, logging tools, observability tools. Debugging tools uh, are a bit difficult to use uh, when, uh, let's say, you are in production. Um, I was talking earlier with one of my students and uh, we were saying, okay, we are in production in our lab because basically we can't really tweak the setup of our computers while the semester is taking place. So basically we are in production. We can't change much. We just need to monitor and fix whatever is to fix. So basically we need to debug. We need to log what happens all the time. So the first step towards monitoring is logging so knowing what happens knowing how your system works in a normal scenario and then uh, observe all the time what happens observability tools and another way to actually understand your system is to do some benchmarking ba basically run some loads run some run some programs that would um, um, uh, make uh, your system uh, loaded and observe what happens with different metrics of the system while you run that load. Um, for methodologies, uh, many times you first need to go and set the problem, make sure that there is a problem uh, if the system performed well before and so on. So these are general uh, things that you need to do. And um, in Linux, luckily you have tools 
that will help you do your performance analysis very fast. So you can get lots of information just by using the Linux tools provided in the system for you. Um, if you want to look into detail about different components of your system, probably you can use this method, looking at the utilization, saturation, and errors for each of the resource. In this case, resource can be a CPU, can be the memory, can be um, the disk, the network, right? So you can analyze each of these components. Um, an image that is quite popular, uh, so basically here you see the application stack uh, from device drivers, uh, operating system, all the way to the application level. And um, you see what tools are provided in Linux to observe your performance. So basically this diagram is again from Brandon Gregg and um, he will uh, have even a more detailed diagram where you have even more tools. So for example, every time when you want to figure out something about your CPU, uh, probably you can start by look, looking at MPSTAT, you can start by uh, looking at uh, PITSTAT, maybe uh, you can analyze um, loads and so on. So every single tool here points to a part of the system. So you can use that tool to figure out different information about the system. I know, so I know that there is, a, yeah, there is another diagram, much more uh, detailed. If you want more, you can get uh, more information here. So this one includes also uh, other types of tools, right? Good. So in general, in order to understand the system, uh, you need to uh, uh, profile the system, basically add some code to actually observe the system. The code can be added in different places, can be added at different levels of the application, can be added in the compile code and so on. Um, it's quite, quite difficult to uh, uh, figure out how um, you add this code. That's why there are tools that have been worked on and uh, studied for years. But at the end of the day, everything translates into adding code at different places in your system. So this translates into overhead. The execution is slowed down when you add this type of instrumentation, basically extra code that needs to be run to observe, yeah, to observe the state of the system. So ideally you want to have minimal impact, but um, the amount of code that you add will translate into overhead. So the time measurements might be inaccurate at some point in time, and um, other measurements should be still useful, but the time measurements might be inaccurate. So basically that's why it's good to actually have your monitoring done with minimum overhead. And then over time, you will pretty much know when there is a change in some of the metrics that the change didn't come from the uh, instrumentation, basically from adding this and extra code, but instead it came from something else that happened in the system. For our computers, what we did, the very first monitoring, very basic monitoring that we can try to do for our computers was to have a Telegram bot. <laughs> yeah, so it's very popular nowadays. The students will always try to do a Telegram bot and show something. So what we do, we actually have a Telegram bot running and um, this bot will uh, go and get the status of each computer uh, from time to time or when on request. So um, you can see here a snippet for our computers in the, uh, computing, uh, in the parallel computing lab. And uh, you can see that um, you can view how many students are logged in and you can view the CPU usage and the memory usage. And you can see this all at once. Yeah, this is helpful because many times the students want a node that doesn't have any other user at the moment. So that's the best way to actually find the node. You will say, okay, that's good enough for yeah, fast usage. Yes, it is. But us, the teaching staff, we actually want more than that. We want to have a way to look at all the uh, metrics that the systems uh, have. 
and figure out when there are uh, jobs that uh, run haywire. Basically, they, they, they start running and consuming resources excessively. And we want to be able to identify past those jobs, stop them quite fast. So basically, uh, what we are doing now, we are building a platform, one platform to actually manage everything, to manage the installation of software, to manage the monitoring of the computers. So um, uh, to do that, we actually uh, need a mix of things. Um, of course, we'll have some type of interface. Uh, we'll have uh, a basically interface to set up, interface to uh, look at the software that we need to install, and interface to look at the state of the machine. Um, then uh, every time we need to set up, we need some information, like the machine list, we need a user's file, we need what software we want to install, and so on. And then we want to have a way to view different metrics, so we'll probably add ways to view new metrics. In order to do our monitoring, um, as usual, we go, we'll, we'll um, actually, we actually, we are building, it's in the process. Uh, we are uh, having a Prometheus um, a server collecting metrics, and then it will be viewed using some uh, Grafana interface. Um, I know that there was a talk in August at Friday Hex. You can find the link here. Uh, where uh, I think Omer was the one. Omer presented uh, exactly this, how they do monitoring in his company. Uh, and exactly Prometheus and Grafana was his tools. You can go and see the, the talk. It's basically about one hour here. I, I pointed to the time where it starts. It's actually very useful. And it's actually very similar to what I wanted to present initially, but then I saw his talk and I was like, okay, I'm not going to repeat the same things. <laughs> so basically go and watch his talk. It's it's a very nice, uh, nicely designed talk. Uh, I think the title in the YouTube is um, monitoring in public, but it's actually monitoring in production. Yeah, so it's monitoring in production. Okay, so we still have this problem. Um, we are working on it. Um, the, the issue is like this, even when we have a platform, even in, when we have all the tools in place, it's still difficult to customize the server resources in a centralized way. You can't do that because you have different ways, different requests for different modules, for different topics to actually work in some specific way. And if you give too many rights to manage, computers, it doesn't matter if they are cluster or if they are uh, lab computers, um, then you introduce lots of security risks. So it's actually very difficult to come up with a platform that is both flexible and secure. Um, another uh, issue that we have is that the resources are used mostly during the semester. So we have a cycle of like four months when we use the resources, then nobody's using the resources. And then the school is always asking us, so uh, we invest so much in like all this setup, and then for about four months per year, we don't use them, right? Yeah, so that's the problem, right? Okay, um, then um, we have this, uh, uh, this preference that the school has towards server grade machines because they want to place them in the SOC compute cluster and there you need server grade machines. And this means that you definitely start needing layers, VMs. So when you need VMs, the, the management is again more difficult. Um, by the way, I also have some measurements looking at different VM, VMs and their performance compared to native. So we have one very good candidate in terms of VM that does well, uh, Singularity does well, very, very well, almost native at the moment for some of the benchmarks that we have tried. So. Um, so, in summary, it's a complicated problem to manage servers, okay? Um, the work continues after deployment and setup. We always have to monitor, monitor our resources. And um, it's the same monitoring that you need to do in production. And monitoring by itself is an extended topic. So, you can actually have several talks on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. 
Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Christina. Any questions you can just post in the Zoom chat or you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, actually, there was a question. Is there a model to teach about all of this? <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, so part of the things I teach in parallel computing, but I don't teach these things from the perspective that I presented today. Basically, I do a lot of performance analysis there. I do monitoring, I explain to the students. Uh, yes, singularity is a container, yeah. Uh, so I present to the students at that uh, time, uh, but yeah. But um, there's actually no module presenting this in like a module and there is content for a module. Yeah, okay, thank you. There is another question. Not sure if you are the right person to ask, but we'll be, get, we'll yeah. be getting rid of some file. So I think some file has lots of connections. Like basically when we set up access to labs, we set up, access through some file. That's the preferred way. It has been done like this for years. And now to actually get rid of some fire, they, they updated some fire recently, I think, but to actually get rid of some fire is a bit difficult. I don't know if they will do it or not. I'm definitely not the right person to know. <laughs> Any other questions from the ground? Yeah. Have you tried other Linux containers text? No, no, not yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> Any suggestions, Howie? So until now, uh, Singularity gave us the base, base results. Why, oh, is there a reason why SOC compute cluster and NUS HPC are managed by different organizations? NUH HPC. Uh, what's NUH HPC? Docker, we've tried, uh, Howie. NUS HPC. Uh, it's high performance computing cluster. I think uh, it's run by, yeah, by NUS IT, exactly. Uh, NUS HPC, we don't get access to it for. Uh, com for teaching, I think. Yeah, and yeah, we don't. Uh, basically, SOC Compute Cluster is mostly designed for SOC. So that's why we do our teaching usually based on from the SOC Compute Cluster. Uh, yeah, SOC has more unique needs. So we need, we need different things. Uh, HPC, I think, is a general resource, right, to get access to it. Yes, SOC also has the, their own Wi-Fi, and the network is weird. <laughs> That's my. <laughs> so, uh, how we uh, alternatives? Uh, Podman, LXC, Docker. Docker, we tried. Podman, no. Uh, but we are trying some alternatives nowadays, and it depends on the workload. Docker is worse. Docker is the worst. Yes, it does a bit more stuff. Docker is the worst. Actually, I have some data if you want to see. <laughs> there are only a few, only a few. Let's see. Only a few. Um, containers currently at the moment, but you can see a bit. So basically, blue is native. Docker is the worst. Usually, this is okay. Let's let's start with the CPU. This is the CPU. CPU uh, a benchmark that has uh, CPU high CPU usage. CPU intensive. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this is how Singularity works, basically, Linux namespace with other things. So that's why they, they do quite well. You see it's almost like native or slightly better sometimes in some measurements. Of course, it depends on the measurement. 
uh, yeah, Docker doesn't affect the CPU. And then this is memory. This is the memory uh, impact, impact on memory. Yes, uh, I.O. we didn't profile yet, looking into it, doing that too. KVM, okay. Yes, so once we decide on a virtual machine, you know, we decide, we say, okay, this is the way to go. We, we, we can go with this. And then we go to the school and say, okay, on your SOC compute cluster, when, we, when you give us virtual machines, we want this stack of virtualization. And you'll be like, uh, really, sure? <laughs> we can't provide that. We can provide a virtual box. Will using public cloud help solve the lack of computing? Uh, public cloud. Uh, so that's that's what we tried. Um, basically, I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that uh, clouds are a solution for the lack of resources indeed. Uh, but the school has tried. And for several modules that they have tried to use cloud uh, services, they noticed that actually they end up paying a lot because of the transfer, the network transfer in and out the nodes. So it's actually not a solution that they accepted, unfortunately. So from what I understand now, they don't allow uh, much uh, clouds, any type of clouds, even uh, public or private, they don't allow because it's too expensive. And basically it doesn't make sense to pay for cloud services instead of actually buying machines that stay with the school. And I totally understand that because the school will use them eventually, especially with the number of students that we have. Yes, Source Academy is running on Amazon Web Services. Yes, it's very expensive. <laughs> Maybe they get grants. They get some grants, they give some grants. It's not that bad, you think? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, it's not that bad indeed. 150 is okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But um, wait a minute. You don't give access to the machines to the students, right? You give a platform to the students in Source Academy, from what I know. Is it true? It feels like the compute cluster, yes, the web app, yes. It feels like the compute cluster is usually quite underutilized. Like most, most of the XCNN nodes having zero load average most of the time, except for nearing the assignment deadlines. So wouldn't there be poor wastage as opposed to provisioning on the fly VMs on cloud services and stuff? Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, that's one of the issues that I mentioned as well. Basically, efficient use of resources is almost impossible to achieve with um, this type of load where we have only teaching load. And we all know that before the deadline, students will work on the machines. Um, any other time, not so much. So um, yes, but we still need to provide the resources somehow, right? Um, yes, that's why I say that cloud resources can be a solution but at the at the moment the current investigation that the school has done i haven't done my own investigation probably i should the the school investigation shows that it's not 100 percent feasible whenever i want to use the compute cluster nodes i can't find free nodes you can't find free nodes because of the bookings right how we Uh, Nigel, I think usually the nodes which have low loads are reserved for teaching. The public free for all nodes have people running some ML tasks most of the time. Yes, indeed. Yes. So that's why we do booking such that we can get uh, some resources that are available. The GPU nodes are always taken all the time by all the AI ML. Not only AI ML modules, I actually book resources, GPU resources as well. At the moment, I have 
eight GPUs booked for my module. <laughs> not eight, 16 I have, 16 I have. <laughs> yeah, so not only AI, ML, tech GPUs, but probably they are underutilized when they are booked indeed. Yeah, good, yes. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Christina, for coming for the talk. It's very, it was really interesting to hear all the insights. Yeah. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank I mean, I don't know how useful or it's, it's a story mostly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. thanks for everyone for coming for the talk as well. So hopefully you have enjoyed the talk given by Prof. Christina and Prof. Gary just now. So yeah, uh, if you could help us to fill in the feedback form, yeah, it would be greatly helpful for us as well. Yeah, thank you for coming.